Good evening. I'm Tim Marshall, and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the College of Design and Social Contexts here at RMIT University, and I'm delighted to join you this evening for what should be a, a wonderful keynote speech. But firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation on whose unceded lands we are gathered this evening. And I expect to acknowledge their elders, past and present. I also acknowledge traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia where RMIT conducts its work. And this acknowledgement has an added relevance, I think, to this evening's discussion, as indigenous ways of knowing and being are critical to much of the change required in our relation to the planet, not in a romantic evocation of a lost past, but rather as a matter of urgency for our collective future survival. To imagine through a relational worldview what it means to live well on and with this planet, to quote John Burroughs, the First Nations Canadian lawyer, is the imperative. Always was, always will be Aboriginal lands. We are delighted to be working with the City of Melbourne's Now or Never Festival to present this special event, and we are honoured to be hosting the keynote speech for, by Indy Johar as part of the festival. Indy is a trained architect, a social entrepreneur, a visionary thinker, and founding director of Double Zero and CEO of Dark Matter Labs. He was awarded the London Design Medal for Innovation in 2022 and is a thought leader in systems change, the future of urban infrastructure finance, outcome-based investment, and the future of governance. And I'm delighted also to announce this evening that Indy will be taking up a fractional appointment as a professor of practice at RMIT University going forward. Tonight, Indy will explore the question of how we create a more equitable, caring, and regenerative future, and he will delve into the concept of planetary thinking and why it's a necessity. The ideas and conversation you hear tonight are linked to an exhibition currently showing at RMIT's Design Hub Gallery, titled Wild Hope, Conver Conversations for a Planetary Col Commons. And it is a great companion to Indy's keynote, and I really recommend you get up to see it over the next few weeks while it's on. Tonight, we're also celebrating RMIT's new partnership with Dark Matter Labs and the launch of our joint venture, the Planetary Civics Initiative. The initiative will bring together local and international researchers, creative practitioners, and industry and nonprofit government professionals united by the goal to shift thinking, dialogue, practice, and public policy from the national to the planetary, or at least to have the planetary incorporated into the national. While climate change, biodiversity loss, and environmental degradation are urgent matters that frame much of our work together, we share an understanding that these, like the many other existential challenges we are confronting, are symptomatic of the design of our systems and the worldview that dominates societal actions and choices. The dark matter of bureaucracy, politics, and economics are designed such that one could reasonably expect the outcomes we see playing out around us. If we humans intentionally develop a way of organizing our affairs, then the resultant systems are designed. It's not the product of chance, it's not the product of a natural process. To quote an old colleague of mine, Clive Dillnot, it is, if it's designed, it can by definition be designed otherwise. And that's, this is our challenge, our task, and our commitment, and dare I say, our excitement. This is a way forward. The Planetary Civics Initiative is an ambitious and vital endeavor intended to address these urgent challenges creatively and equitably. And because the environmental, societal, and technological transformations underway are inherently planetary in nature, this initi initiative is intended to connect into a growing network of institutions, organizations, and communities that are similarly committed to systemic planetary action. The DM partnership is also a provocation for the university and as part of the work we are doing to find new ways of undertaking transdisciplinary work at RMIT. This transdisciplinary approach is a challenge for universities that are historically grounded in siloed disciplines, but it's also essential, it's, but, it's, but it is essential we make changes to this operating model if we are to ensure that the knowledge and talent of the academy fulsomely contributes to the society's greatest challenges and opportunities. And RMIT is in a very good position to make this move, thanks to the university's depth and breadth in design research and education, as well as the university-wide 
eight enabling impact, Im enabling impact platforms. We are launching the Planetary Civics Initiative with two projects, Planetary Papers and the Design Research Studios. The Planetary paper series will consist of commissioned interviews and commentary from leading international experts across a range of professional disciplines, perspectives, and backgrounds. This ever-expanding media archive will provide the intellectual and practical foundation for the initiative and be an online resource freely available to anyone who would like to explore them. Each of the design research studios will be clusters of partner projects with academics, industry fellows, PhDs, and the like, working within broader interwoven themes such as governance and policy making, biodiversity boundaries and habitation, cities, mobility and infrastructure, trade, finance and labor, technology, data and ethics and so on. There are clearly many facets to our partnership and we expect it to evolve over time and to draw on the resources of RMIT Europe in Barcelona, our campuses in Vietnam as well as those here in Nam. Now, at the conclusion of Indy's talk, he'll be joined by Naomi Steed, and I'll introduce her now so we can move straight into that session after his talk. Naomi Steed is a professor in the School of Media and Communication at RMIT University, and she is the, also the director of the Design and Creative Practice Enabling Capability Platform, working with RMIT researchers across design and creative fields and beyond to engage in high-impact interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research for social and environmental benefit. Throughout her career, she's been committed to research-based advocacy into gender equity and work-related well-being in architectural and creative practice workplaces and ways in which creative practice and education can respond to the climate and biodiversity catastrophe. Steed has edited and co-edited six books, including the award-winning After the Australian Ugliness through NGV and Thames Hudson in 2020, she is a board member of the Open House Melbourne and is widely published as a critic and commentator most recently, and most recently as the architecture critic for the Saturday paper. In 2023, she was the recipient of the prestigious Bates Smart Award for Architecture in the Media. But now, can you join me in welcoming Indy Johar to the podium and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Hello. Um, good evening. I'm absolutely honoured and delighted to be here. Um, it's a privilege to be amongst so many amazing people, and it's a privilege to have this sort of form of conversation. I suppose what I want to do is put forward a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that we are living in a transition. The transition we are living in is perhaps a one in a 400 year transformation. A transformation in our world view. As much as Newtonian enlightenment structured a world view in divisibility, in perspective, in classification theory, so we're living in a new world of interbeing, entanglement, and interrelationships. And it's changing how we exist in the world. And in that context, climate change is a symptom of the failure of an old worldview. And in that context, what does change look like as we start to think about the future? And I suppose in that context, I I'm part of an organization called Dark Matter Labs. We're about 70 people working from South Korea all the way through to Canada. And what we're trying to do is demonstrate a different world and a different worldview as possible. Now, we often talk about the transition, and in a way, we often talk about the transition from a perspective of technologies. But I'm going to argue over the course of the next 40 minutes, that this is not just a world, a transition of technologies, but actually a deeper transformation of how we perceive ourselves and how we perceive our relationships with the world. And in that form, it's a transformation of how we organize the world around us. 
It's a transformation in our institutions, our theories of property, our theories of perhaps even ownership and, and even beyond. And what I want to do, start off with, is by actually talking about the scale of the transformation that we're in the middle of. I want to start that by asking a question that's probably quite dear to many Australians. But I'm going to talk, talk at it from a European context. In a European context, every state in Europe, pretty much most of the world, has signed up to the Paris Accords. And as a result of the Paris Accord, ask yourself how many homes all of Europe can afford to build if it was to follow the Paris Accord, which it signed up to. You can afford to build about 144,000 homes, all of Europe. Britain alone has a target of 300,000 homes. All of Europe, somewhere between about 1.4, 1.5 million homes a year. Now, why I want to talk about that is I want to articulate the scale of the transition we're facing. On one hand, we know we need more homes to deal with spatial justice issues. On the other hand, we don't actually have the carbon budgets to deliver those homes. Place that conversation in Australia. How do we deliver spatial justice when we don't actually have the carbon budgets to build the homes that we need to? Now, why I articulate this, this, this issue is it starts to bring into focus the scale of what we're witnessing, the scale of what we're actually having to deal with. And then put this into context. Let's look at actually when people talk about the transition and the policy landscape, what we're really lining up for. What we're really lining up for is close to between 3, 2.8 to 3 degrees at currently, and most likely near 4 degrees. 4 degrees temperature rise is genuinely large-scale genocide. Just to put that really clearly. Anywhere close to those sort of figures, when you talk about on average 3 degrees, you'll talk about some cities being up to 12 degrees warmer. So when we start to talk about these things, I think it's really worth looking at the scale of what we're witnessing. At the same time, let's look at the scale of the challenge. Our growth in GDP is almost one-to-one -one correlated with growth in carbon emissions and a growth with our material economy. The average Swede consumes 27 tons of matter a year. The global average is 1.5 tons. So if we want to actually dematerial, if we want to deal with our de carbon economies, we're going to have to actually delaminate our growth from our material economy. We're going to have to dematerialize our economies substantively. At this stage, there is no economy in the world that has actually dematerialized its growth. The UK and US theoretically have, but that's largely through outsourcing their production to China and other parts of the world. So if we start to look at this, it starts to talk about the scale of what we're witnessing. Then let's talk about energy. We all congratulate ourselves. 30% of houses in Australia have solar panels. But let me put that in context for you. Between 2019 and 2020, global energy demand increased, the increase in global energy demand in that one year was greater than all the installed renewables in that one year. So the scale of what we're facing is a transformation in our energy. We've been living of energy which has been taken millions of years to store in the earth, and we've been extracting it, and now actually we've been polluting our land atmosphere to the point that it's become self-terminating for us with the loss of predictable weather. 
So the scale of the transformation is massive. And energy is almost certainly correlated with any form of complex civilization. So if we talk about this transformation, we have to talk about actually rebuilding our entire energy systems. At the same time, our energy systems have massively been changing. So it used to take one barrel of oil in the 1920s to release nearly 100 barrels of oil's worth of energy. Now, one barrel of oil releases between five to seven barrels of oil. So energy is, we're getting far less energy out of the system that we were getting. That's already happened. Then if you look at our food systems, our food systems, which used to be energy generative, i.e. we used to get energy out of our food system, net as civilization, actually consume more energy than they, they produce for humans. So when we start to look at the energy systems that we're dealing with, we're talking about a large-scale transformation. Then let's put that in, this into context. This is a graph by The Economist and a visualization. And what it starts to show is actually the loss of human habitable niche zones around the world by 2070. So when people talk about global migration, millions of people are being on the move, hundreds of millions, we already know there are more people that have been displaced in the last X years than actually World War II. We know the numbers are going to look in the region of hundreds of millions, if not billions, as a result of this trans transition. So if we start to think about this, what does this really mean for our environment, how we choose to live, and what the future looks like? How many of you here are vegan? You're all smart people. we got one. So look at that graph. You know when people talk about the Anthropocene? It's kind of a casual academic word. It drops out of our lips. We're living in the Anthropocene. And that's what it means. You see the kind of plant, uh, animals and birds? That's all the wild animals and birds. The giraffes, the kangaroos, the elephants. That's them. On the left-hand side. Cattle is what you see at the top. There's perhaps more sheep than there are wild animals. So when we start to look at this scale, that's what the Anthropocene means. And then when people say, well, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna build our houses out of timber and biomaterials, this is the future. Well, we also know that 80% of our forest destruction is being driven by our food systems. And we also know that if we're going to actually move towards biomaterial economies, we're going to have to do significant land transformation, land use transformation, to talk about agroforestry and shift our agricultural frameworks and what we consume in order to build, build that, those forest pumps. We need forests to pump, sequester carbon for nearly 500 years to deal with some of the CO2 issues that we've got. And when we talk about timber, everyone talks about, oh, I've got building a timber building. We also need to recognize that when we are talking about this, we need the timber to sequestered carbon for 200 years. 200 years. So if you put a timber facade on your building, it doesn't do anything really, because after about 35 to 40 years, you're going to have to replace it, unless it's tarred or dealt with in a completely different way. So we're talking about quite a fundamental transformation in land use, what we consume, to be able to make some of these transitions. At the same time, we know we're losing the idea of predictable weather. And the loss of predictable weather, climate, and the instability of our climate means that actually our soil systems and agricultural systems become even more vulnerable and fragile. For example, in 2070, we're expecting to have lost the glaciers in Switzerland. Those glaciers provide stable water systems across much of Europe. The loss of those stable water systems undermines our agricultural frameworks. 
So I'm articulating this because I don't think we're actually genuinely communicating the scale of the transition we're in the middle of. And the unfortunate or the fortunate thing is, this is no longer about saying, it's our kids that are gonna have to fight the battle. You know what, let's get the next generation to do it. This is all in your watch, all in your watch. In the next 10 years, most of this future is gonna get cast. There's no kids to worry about, it's you. You are those people that are being called upon to make those transitions. And we know whether it's topsoil, the destruction of our topsoils, which we're seeing significantly, or it's effectively ocean acidification, large-scale loss of plankton, we're seeing the fundamental destruction of our ecological base that's really significant. And if you look at biodiversity losses, it's a thousand times faster than normal. It's equivalent to a sixth level, sixth uh, great extinction at the planetary scale. And yet, at the same time, accord after accord, we see pretty much minimal impact. I believe it was uh, President George Bush, the first one, who said in the Rio summit, American lifestyles are not up for negotiating. I think all of our lifestyles are going to be transformed, whether we like it or not. And what makes this moment unique, and I think uni more unique than any other moment, there have been civilization collapses in the, across the planet many, many times. But why this one is slightly different is perhaps for the first time we're living in a fully entangled planetary civilization. Your food systems, your energy systems, your microchips, we're entangled. It takes a planet to build an iPhone. And that entanglement means that there's no viable escape to New Zealand strategy. Right? There was this kind of, I'm a billionaire, I'm gonna to escape to New Zealand. And you very quickly figured out in COVID, you don't have paracetamol, you don't have vaccines, you don't have microchips, because you don't have the production capacity to do that. Hell, in all of Europe, there wasn't a paracetamol manufacturer over COVID. So yes, there's an escape to New Zealand strategy if you want to live in the Middle Ages, because that's what you end up with. So we're living in a moment, a planetary civilization, and our entanglements are so significant that I fundamentally believe that we face a fork. A fork between mutually assured thriving and mutually assured destruction. And that mutually assured destruction is structured on two levels. One, all of our planetary entanglements, as I laid out. But two, the availability of large-scale nuclear weapons, biological weapons, information weapons. Those two things force us to actually talk about a transition where actually no one can be afforded to really be left behind. Many environmentalists I know turn around and say, the carrying capacity of the planet is a billion. No, the carrying capacity of the planet is a billion, or actually, if you remove 800 million lifestyles, all of our lifestyles, mine and yours, the planet is just fine, so is 7.2 billion people. So, we're going to have to find another way and be sure about it that if we work a journey where seven billion people are lost in our transition, the level of trauma and violence we'll have set up, there'll be very little chances of us surviving in the process. And that means that for the first time, I would argue that we have to make a planetary transformation. It means that we have to acknowledge that we have been living in a great war. A war against ourselves, a war against our eco ecological systems, a war against future generations. And unless we find a pathway for a great peace, actually this has some serious ramifications. And this goes to say that as we start to look forward, this is why I say that climate change is a symptom of the failure. The failure is much more structural. 
at the level of how we perceive ourselves and how level of how we perceive ourselves in relationship to the world. So, if we want to address this reality, we're going to have to do many things together. We're going to have to dematerialize our economy. We're going to have to shift our economy from the growth of material goods to intangible goods. So the growth of care, the growth of creativity, the growth of cognitive, uh, complex cognition. At the same time, we're going to have to shift our material economy to becoming circular and bio, uh, biomass driven. We're also going to have to transform our food systems, as I said. Massive transformation of our food systems. It's almost certainly the number one crisis that we're going to face. We're going to have to transform our energy systems. We're going to have to regrow our bio, biological base. And we're going to have to transform how we as societies make decisions. Our decision-making capacity is locked into an industrial idea of industrial democracy. An industrial democracy which is linear and projective. And we're not able today to take complex decisions as societies in face of which is almost a self-terminating condition. How do we make decisions together in the wake of these form translations? How do we make decisions together when actually we're living in a multitude of agents? Democracy has decentralized power brilliantly to many, many people. But how do we make decisions in the age of this com in complex complexity? So what we are facing is a fundamental transition. And what we are facing is what I would call, the al where do we allocate capital? We can allocate capital to a can of cola, which gives addictive because it's got sugar in it. It outsources its carbon because it's effectively producing vast amounts of carbon in terms of the aluminium can or other forms of water, water damage that it does. Or we can allocate, and this is, it vastly externalizes, maybe it costs a dollar, but it externalizes vast amounts of costs. Or we can allocate it to a sustainable apple, which internalizes its cost, is healthy for you, and effectively drives um, regeneration of soil if it's well managed. Yet currently, our capital allocation is entirely to the can of cola. The shirt I'm wearing costs between 30 to 40 pounds. I don't wear expensive shirts. But if you were to do true cost analysis on it, in terms of actually social and environmental costs, it costs between 250 to 450 pounds. Because we externalize those costs and we externalize them to the point of environment and other issues which aren't priced into our society. So as we look into that, someone is paying for those costs. Those costs are being accrued in society, we're just not paying for it. So how do we move from an economy focused on cola and the externalization of costs to an economy that's deeply regenerative? And to illustrate that point, an urban tree, a tree outside in Melbourne, for example, on the streets. Most trees in Sheffield, for example, were, after 10 years, are chopped out because urban trees are, are a liability. They have a maintenance cost and they have an insurance cost. But any of the environmental benefits, whether it's flood risk management, whether it's heat island impacts, tree-lined streets reduce uh, the temperature on streets by up to 12 degrees. Those only mature after 40 years. So what you tend to do is because the maintenance costs are high and the insurance costs are high, these trees get chopped down after 10 years and replaced by fresh trees. But their benefits only accrue by 40 years. How we account for this, how, you know, architects as architects, we can often draw lovely, massive, beautiful trees, but our accounting system isn't designed for it. Those trees are just liabilities, they're not even assets. Mental health of a city isn't even accrued. The material registry of a city isn't understood. So, this transformation requires us to reimagine these things, like the collective intelligence of a city. How do we understand that as an asset in the 21st century? How do we perceive these things? 
And then there's fundamental questions, like a private house. A private house which is privately owned, but is poorly held together, poorly insulated, poorly looked after, generates huge costs for public and social goods. Those costs are externalized. This is a piece of work we did in Birmingham which looked at a private house and its implications to social costs. So how do we deal with these entanglements? How do we deal with positive entanglements? The High Line in New York, we looked at that High Line and we scraped all the data. It cost 140 million to make the High Line in New York. It generated 3.48 billion in land value uplift. All of that land value uplift was effectively privatized. You've all benefited from a housing boom, right? How much have you done to build that housing boom? You've benefited from the increase in land value. From where is the land value? If I took your house and moved it to the middle of Nova Scotia, how much is your house worth? Nothing. The value comes from its monopolistic access to public goods. Transportation, labor markets, schools. All of that value has been accrued to you. I would argue that's a great enclosure of civic value. Very much like the High Line's value was actually enclosed by all the land that surrounded it. The value is created by civic goods. What does that mean? How do we deal with that? And there are ways of looking at how do you organize these frameworks. And we've been looking at stuff like smart covenants in ways to actually be able to share that land value uplift in different formats. So if we start to look at the transition, what becomes really clear is the transition requires investments in new forms of assets, tree canopies of a city, the retrofit of whole cities, but the retrofitting of whole cities isn't going to be priced on the basis of energy savings alone. It's healthcare costs, it's economic, e economic development, all sorts of things. The mental health of a city. These are next generation assets. They're entangled. They're non-divisible in the traditional format. And living in this entanglement, I think, forces us to think about some of the fundamental relationships we have in the world. A different relationship to nature. Many of you will have seen some of the really amazing work that's been going on in New Zealand but around the world where actually rivers start to own themselves or forests start to own themselves. Where we expand the idea of agency in the world to outside human agency. Where we recognize, you know, if you speak to indigenous elders, they will talk about the nation of trees. They will understand the agency of the world around you. Land is self-sovereign to which you have a relationship to. You don't own it. Do you have the right to destroy soil which takes thousands of years to build? How do we start to exist in this world in a different way? I found this beautiful. This is in Taiwan and indigenous relationships to actually even the borrowing of stones from the river to make the house. How do we live in a different form of relationship to the world and our materiality? How do we exist? If you look at um, First Nations and Indigenous Nations in Canada and the US and Turtle Island, what you start to see is these nations overlap. There are 700 odd nations plus in Canada alone. How do the indigenous, how do we have a new reconciliation of the indigenous and the crown to imagine a new form of singularity? And I would argue that at a quantum level, we're moving from a kind of in, enlightenment, Newtonian worldview to a quantum worldview. And that actually rhymes with indigenous ways of seeing. These aren't two different worldviews, they're actually converging. If you talk to some of our 
most interesting technology people, they'll talk about how do you build self-sovereign cars or self-sovereign technologies which own themselves. How does that worldview start to converge with even trees owning themselves or a forest owning themselves? Or even a sea? So what if a forest is self-sovereign? What if as a building or your home is self-sovereign? What if a camera is self-sovereign? So no one owns it. And I suppose the point I'm trying to make is how do you actually operate outside single point optimizations? How do you operate in a world of entanglements? How do you actually understand entanglement from a decentralized distributed perspective rather than single points? And this requires us to actually much more deeply transform what I would argue is the dark matter. English as language is very noun orientated. We see the world through objects. The Anishwabi language, for example, is verb orientated. The mountain is flowing. Right? The mountain is a verb, it's not an object. What happens when you start to see the world through verbs as opposed to nouns? What happens to the glass? What happens to the things around you? What happens to recognize that all the matter that we hold, we only hold momentarily. It's a flow, a knot in the flow of that matter. It's not just language, it's also the, the enlightenment in an Newtonian enlightenment, the object-oriented worldview, also was built on theories of then building perspective, distance, articulating distance, classification theory, which allowed for divisibility. And we know, right, we know for a fact the theory of race was constructed off the back of classification theory as a means to permit violence. It isn't genetically rooted. There's no science behind it. All of Africa, the continent of Africa, has greater biological diversity than anywhere else, in the, and the human DNA diversity, than the rest of the planet. It's nothing to do with actual. It was actually a classification model that permitted a theory of violence. That, that objectification. So if we start to recognize our entanglements, we have to recognize the nature of the violence that worldview is allowed. We have to recognize the need for a great peace. And this goes at the root of every aspect. Theories of property, theories of identity, theories of entanglement, but also the theory of you. You're all brilliant people, but we know your brain is a function of your social networks, social brain. We know it's a function of also of your gut, we also know, in terms of epigenetics, have a vast implication on you and how you grow. We also know that if you put a child in an um, impoverished household, right, a financially stressed household, their IQ is lowered by up to 12 IQ points. So what's your meritocracy in this? So when we start to understand these entanglements, and you know, the word meritocracy, which was used by Michael Young, Sir Michael Young, for the first time, he was using it in a parody to talk about it as being an illusion, illusion that it, of our own rights, that we think we are great. But actually these entanglements are problematic. So all the way down the table, from our language to actually property, to how we, or our theory of identity, how we perceive ourselves as individuals, or as opposed to interbeings in relationship with the world. These are all going to be questioned and are being questioned. The science is already there. It's less a question of science. It's just that we're living, it's still in an industrial age, an industrial worldview. The science has already told us most of this stuff. So the question is, how do we as a civilization evolve? How do we have this conversation? How do we re-examine theories of property? So, historic property wasn't actually an abstracted right. It was an embodied right. You were in relationship, in treaty with land. 
and Catherine Pistoire's brilliant work, Code of Capital, the coding of property, the divisibility of property, the right to abuse, which is encoded in property. This was all structured. So how do we start to reimagine these things? How do we start to reimagine whether it's licensing or rights or any of these frameworks? What I would put forward to you is that actually our bureaucratic worldview, which was put together, Weber put, sort of articulated it very elegantly, was born in 18th, 19th century Germany. Actually, we're moving from an analog bureaucracy to a digital bureaucracy. And that's transforming how we can construct relationships with the world. If I was to show you a picture of the Mississippi River over the last thousand years, what you will see is hundreds of little different flows that have evolved over the last thousand years. It's not been a fixed line, yet our maps show it as a fixed line, yet it's evolving, it's changing. What does property look like if it's relational to the river as opposed to fixed and determinate? How do we start to build a different way of looking at this worldview? How do we start to look at a worldview where actually theories of human dominion, where we own the world, where we see the world full of dead things or quasi-dead things, to see the world in a, in a form where we are in relationship to, in treaty with the world? And that's not just sort of whether it's urban forests or whether it's actually maybe even cars and cameras. How do we expand our thesis of agency? Imagine if we talked about the population of Australia to include all life. The population of Australia is not just maybe humans, but all life. Just that little concept of reimagining our theory of population. How does it make us more accountable to the whole completeness of life that is held on, on this continent? How do we start to deal with these transformations? How do we start to deal with these transformations, both in terms of addressing, and I think this is where I would say, we're facing great uncertainty, risks and transformations in potential. But the potential side is really important. There is a potential in what we're talking about, a reimagination of what it means to be human. It pains me greatly to see a human being holding open a door. And it should pain you greatly. Because a human being is an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. Extraordinary thing. Born in stars, literally, our matter inside us. It's the most powerful general intelligence that's ever been created. Far more impressive than chat GDP, which is just a statistical, reverse-looking uh, sort of machine. Humans are far more incredible, yet our employment contracts, which are extensions of slavery, if you look back at it, their root, reduce us to being bad robots. How do we reimagine what it means to be human, but reimagine what it means to be human as a great emancipation of being human, not just bad machines? And remember, management theory comes out of military. It comes out of command and control. How do we reimagine a fit age of organizing which goes beyond command and control? That unlocks the full capacity of being human. A new theory of dignity. A new theory of freedom. A freedom and emancipation to be human. Not just a freedom to escape the system. Those things are as important as the transformation of our relationship with carbon to reconstruct a new dignity of being human. And there is massive potential. And we've done this in history. So if you look back at the vault schools in Sweden, the Nordics were one of the most poorest nations in the world in the 18th and 19th century. 19th century. They were one of the poorest in the world. And they invested in vault schools. 10% of the population in the 19th century went to these vault schools. 10%. And there they taught philosophy and technology. They were trying to build self-authoring capacity of people. 
people who could author their own lives. To be philosopher makers, as Polini said it eloquently. We need a new generation of philosophers makers. We don't need the just do it generation. We need a new generation of philosophers makers. People who author their own lives. Who aren't bad robots, but actually who unleash the full capacity of being human. And that emancipation is as important as every other transition that we face. And in that di discovery of human dignity, and that discovery of not being a management model which is based on control. So I often say the future of CEOs is not chief executive officers, but chief learning officers. You want to build coherence in an organization, you build coherence through the capacity of an organization to learn. If you want to build accountability, you build accountability through learning and transparency of your behaviors. And in a complex emergent world, building coherence through learning is not a moral thing. It's the most effective way of organizing if you want to unlock the full capacity of being humans. And that has implications for how we use machines, the machine-human synthesis, but also actually has implications for how we relate to the planet. So, looking at it through that lens, I want us to start to think, I mean, James Lovelock in his last book, Nova Scene, the first third of it is the most extraordinary vision of actually imagining the planet. He imagines, and rightly, rightfully so, he makes a case that the planet is becoming conscious. The fact that we can use satellites to become aware of the damage we're doing to the planet and not only become aware, we can address the damage we're doing to the planet. That can preserve the biological system that keeps this planet cool. The fact that we can build that awareness, that the planet is becoming conscious to be able to adjust to, the, to ourselves. And that's a remarkable thing. A moment that the planet itself is becoming conscious. A machine-human ecological synthesis. I think in that planetary future, we're at the cusp of a vast transformation, a vast transformation of our possibility. And that gives me great hope. At the same time, I think that that journey that we are invited to, a landscape of mutually assured thriving, a new landscape of machine, human, ecological synthesis, is also we need to be counted and be careful. Careful of the fact that there's no pathway to a great simplification. Do not romanticize the illusion of the local. You live in a planetary age. You are interdependent. You live in a world where the Sahara Desert feeds, feeds the Amazon. You live in a world where CO2 is a planetary phenomena. You live in a world where the iPhone or your phone is a planetary phenomena. And like I said, there was no New Zealand strategy. There's no strategy to isolate ourselves. There's no strategy of isolation. And in that entanglement, we need to step forth. Step forth and embrace the fact that we've entered a new age. Step forth and recognize this is a transformation of how we see ourselves and our relationships around the world. Step forth and reimagine all the dark matter that we've constructed over the last 400 years is going to be reimagined. And that's an extraordinary invitation for us as a generation to reimagine. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time and hopefully we'll get into some of the questions as we get further into this. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Indy, um, for a really fantastic presentation which was as insightful and inspiring as always. 
Um, I'm delighted that we've got a little bit of time for a Q&A here uh, to delve into um, your thoughts a little further. Um, I will start us off with a couple of questions to give you all time to marshal your questions, and we would love to hear from the audience. Um, I wanted to start by taking up where you left off, really, around the question of hope. As Tim mentioned, part of the reason you've been in Melbourne has been to open that exhibition, Wild Hope Conversations for a Planetary Commons. And your lectures are always very sobering, of course, but at the same time galvanising and inspiring, and I would say hopeful. And you've talked here this evening about, the, about potential, about the significance of potential. Um, but of course, we're living now in a context of, uh, you know, there is much talk about solastalgia, about doomism, um, about a mental health crisis that is parallel to and stems from the climate crisis. So in light of all this, why is hope so important now and what gives you hope? Um, so several factors. One, I'd say, to quote Jurassic Park, life wants to live. Um, and that gives me deep hope. I genuinely think life wants to live and the choice that we have is that fork. And the second thing is, firstly, I recommend you all go and see the exhibition. And the reason why I recommend you all see the exhibition is I think one of the most interesting things for me about that exhibition is that it articulates the, the nature of the transition we're facing. Too often, the conversations by politicians and any form of leaders is, right, we need new technology. We need to invest in the latest AI. We need to get the data going. That's where economic growth is. And what that exhibition shows, that actually what we need is a world shift. And in that world shift is a fundamentally different perspective on the nature of technologies that we need. And I think only in the combination of that world shift will we unlock the technologies of the 21st century. Most of our technological landscapes are still structured in an old world view. I think we're living in a paradigm of our technologies being part of an old world view. And I think what that exhibition does is highlight why we need a different worldview. So Leonardo da Vinci in Vitruvian Man, when he sits there in the platonic square in the circle, is an idea of what it means to be human. I think we're in a transformation of that order where actually our vision of what it means to be human is fundamentally has to be reimagined and thereby all of our technologies of how we construct them and our relationship with them is being reimagined. So what gives me great hope is actually that is an invitation to recast. Recast the world that's been given to us in a way that's actually possible. The science of it is mostly there. Our capabilities are mostly there. Most of the issue right now is we're locked into paradigms and norm norms that we don't even know how to question. So we're, it, we're fish in a kind of polluted water system and we can't even see the water. But the hope, life wants to live. Life really wants to live. And I think this is going, this is going to be an invitation for us to do that. So, Indy, you and I both come from an architectural training, but we're both people who've taken that training and uh, ended up using it in other ways and other contexts. So I've got a question for you about design, about the significance of design in the kind of mass transformation that you're referring to here. How important are creative practice and design, particularly what you've described as small d design, in this coming transition? So for me, design has is, is been superbly important because I think what design taught me was how to work across disciplines and capabilities. This worldview is going to be created at the intersection of how we reimagine beyond property to how do we reimagine new forms of financing, new forms of monetary policy, all the way through to even how we own materials and our transformations of our material economy. And the ability to synthesize across these disciplines is really critical in the creation of the new. And what design, I think, you know, certainly architecture teaches us, is to be able to synthesize. I think management is for the preservation and the management of the status quo. Design, strategic design, is about the synthesis of the new at the intersection of the many. And that's where I think design is a really powerful and necessary capability. And I don't think it's just about architects. I think most of us need to be taught design. 
design as a capability to synthesize in a complex emergent age. And I think it's a critical capability for the 21st century. You've also talked, as a follow-up, you, you and your colleague Zara Saidi have described very eloquently the urgent need for a new imagination infrastructure. And I'm particularly interested in what that might mean for the more speculative or conceptual or propositional end of the design and creative practice spectrum. So can you tell us, I mean, how can these highly speculative creative practice or design approaches leap that gap to become tangible outcomes with you know, things in the world with real benefit and impact? I think sort of people scaffold their imagination in many, many ways. I mean, I suppose what, one of the things that was mind blowing for me was just, you know, speaking to someone like John Burroughs, who would describe the world in a fundamentally different way to what I'd been used to. Um, he's an incredible indigenous lawyer in Canada. and. You know, he would show me a different way of seeing the world. He would question my theory of language. I think, for me, imagination is constructed on the roots of these, these units of language, of ways of perceiving. And recoding them, actually, when you start to recode those ways of seeing, allows you to see a fundamentally different world, and a fundamentally different worldview. You know, what if things... If you look at our economic thesis of assets, which is all about dead things, I would argue. It's a world of managing dead things. Whereas, what does an economy of agents look like? What is an economy where we understand the agency of things? And I think technology is opening up vast landscapes of a kind of new economy of agency. And in that context, that requires imagination. A new form of kind of animistic kind of intelligence is going to be grown, is being grown around us. I think that's an incredible unfurling of the possible and a new kind of interface with the world and our imagination with the world. So I think the codes almost in a way, I have to say I'm, I'm very reluctant to, um, to describe the future, right? I'm, I'm not here giving you an image of the future. What I'm trying to explain is let's imagine an Australia which recognizes the population as all of life. Now imagine that and what that would mean day to day. Imagine an Australia which understood the world of agency, which every house was an agent in its own right. And what I'm try, I often try to do is expand the world through understanding a different possibility, but leave it open to comprehension and uh, sort of reimagination by everyone else around us. And I think that's really, really, really critical. Um, but I do think this is rooted in a different way of seeing and a different language and a different way of comprehending the world. And that, I think, is extraordinary. Mm. Um, speaking, following on from your points there about assets and the management of assets as, as bespeaking a particular mode of thought, um, I was struck this evening in your presentation about, you, you know, you're recalling the origins of property and the right to destroy, and then the question around do we have a right to destroy soil, which has taken 10,000 years to produce, um, but the question is really around a value system that could frame soil as almost literally nothing, as dirt. And um, that I'm sure some people destroy soil with, entirely without thinking, without conceiving of that as um, A, precious, or B, old. So the question is, how do we change that kind of value system that, for example, understands soil as dirt, as, as almost literally nothing, into, into one that does turn that around, understands the value? Yeah, and in history it was interesting, right? So Sweden, um, your inheritance tax, if you were a farmer, was gauged on whether you had the soil had become richer and thicker. So if your soil had become richer and thicker, you would have less uh, inheritance tax. If it had become worse, you would have a higher inheritance tax. So it's really interesting. Yet, right now, if you're a farmer, the soil is not on your balance sheet. It, there's not, soil is not an asset. So we've devalued it, we've removed it from being value. And it, it misunderstands and miscalibrates the world around us. So that's why I was saying, I think how we've accounted for value is actually shaped and misshaped the world around us. And that's why it's okay as designers to draw, you know, to draw the tree, but actually the tree sits on an accounting theory. And unless we transform the accounting theory, the tree is just an illusion. It's a plastic thing that will never deliver. 
So you're absolutely right. I want to turn now to, to thinking about learning. So you've talked this evening about the idea of um, chief executive officers becoming chief learning officers. And of course, the new um, relationship between Dark Matter Labs and RMIT, the Planetary Civics Initiative, is a relationship between a university, which of course is a research institution, but also a place of teaching and learning. Um, and I, I must say there was spontaneous applause when you gave a, um, a presentation, seminar presentation earlier last week at RMIT when you talked about the need to transform the institutions of learning to um, predicate care over control. So I wonder if you might say something more about the transformative power of learning and its relationship to care. So, I mean, it, it, like I was saying, I think in a complex emergent world, you have to operate in a theory of care because you do not know your second and third order consequences. So a relation, relationship of care is fundamental. And then what's also really critical is that actually in a complex emergent world, I can't anticipate or predict um, an action. What I have to do is build the learning capacity of the system to organize and transform itself. And that's why in a complex emergent world, your behavior has to be care orientated, but your, your coherence has to be a function of learning. And that learning is a continuous act. It's not something that you, you know, for example, in dark matter, we don't talk about what actions we did. We talk about what did we learn and we compound that learning. And we sort of talk about what's our action, what's our learning. And in that way, what you're doing is driving the organization through a continuous process of learning in context. And I think that co coherence in a complex age requires a function of learning. You know, every 100 days we come together as an organization to reflect what did we achieve, what did we learn, what are the weak signals we're hearing. That allows the strategy function of organization to be a continuous process based on those things. But it also requires a different, you know, uh, our employment contracts are different. We pay fundamentally differently. We, we don't pay people for the work they do. We pay people in order for them to be able to do the work they want to do. It's like a personal basic income. And we've constructed a different organizational model to be able to do that. So you have to be able to construct this all the way down. This is what I was talking about. Our employment contracts are largely extensions of theories of slavery. They're not about the full unfur unfurling of human capacity and unlocking that. And we have to reimagine those relationships in a deep sense. We have unlimited, uh, unlimited holidays. And what we base it on is you have a, a responsibility for the mission of the organization, a responsibility to your colleagues, and a responsibility to yourself. And we expect people to be adults and citizens in that sense. Um, and that requires a different form of citizenship of an organization, a different form of behavior. I wonder, in that context, you know, speaking of learning, whether you might say something more about why you're interested in collaborating with a, you know, a very large, um, comprehensive university um, as part of this agenda. Um, fundamentally, I think what's becoming clear to us is that the work that's required requires a new form of intersectional knowledge, knowledge that goes across disciplines and depths, whether it's <coughs> legal design, monetary design, property rights, all the way through to new ways of kind of looking at participation, new forms of treaties constructed through radical participation, to new forms of kind of uh, sensing capacities, new forms of governance. No one organization can actually build or under build, build that scale of depth of knowledge. And we need research at fundamental levels, because I think we're living in an age of kind of craft, craft-based learning. And we need that intersection of learning which is orientated in craft across disciplines. And I think we need to build new knowledge ecosystems between universities and practitioners in a fundamentally different way to build those capabilities. One of the big challenges that is often talked about and somebody who's not often talked about very well is people like Peter Thiel. And Peter Thiel talks about the fact that you know, since the 1970s, what we prioritized is monolithic, siloed knowledge bases. Yet every major innovation is between disciplines, biochemistry, right? 
what you have is between disciplines, whole new fields are being constructed, whole new capabilities are being constructed. And I think we're now living in an age where between disciplines, we're going to construct whole new classes of value. And those between disciplines will have to be constructed in craft with the world because of the complexity. And so I think that's why organizations like Dark Matter and universities, I think we have to be part of an ecosystem, ecosystem of knowledge and practice to be able to build these capabilities for transformations. I think we have to talk about universities as guilds, knowledge guilds in partnership with organizations like Dark Matter, but many other more brilliant organizations. Because I think this craft-based knowledge and intersectional knowledge across disciplines is going to be critical. And so those interfaces are vital. All right, I'm going to just ask you one last question and then we will throw to questions from the floor. You've spoken in the past about the future rhyming with the past. What do you mean by that? What I'm finding, you know, if so I, and during the course of this talk, I spoke a lot about indigenous ways of seeing. And I would argue that many indigenous ways of seeing actually have strong parallels with quantum or entanglement ways or inter relational ways of being. And technology and our comprehension of being human and the science of it is increasingly seeing the world in the same way. So I would argue that our, our modernity, you know, this, this brilliant book, Hospiting Modernity, I would say modernity is actually accelerating to the point that it starts to see a relational worldview. So I think we are starting to see a rhyme with the past. But this rhyme is at a planetary scale, right? This rhyme is at a planet, you, you are a planetary being. You are part, you are entangled at the planetary level. And I think we know that whether it's your microbiomes or other things, I think there's some research projection done that if you took a, you know, I think the greatest illusion of our age was the 1960s picture of a human being in an astronaut suit as the future. Because it created this illusion that humans could be isolated from the world. We know that if you isolate humans from all the microbiomes of the world, actually you go very stupid very quickly. Literally, your intelligence levels falls off. And that's one of the big challenges that over the 100 years, I don't think if humans were isolated from the microbiomes of the rest of the planet, our intelligence would fall off massively to the point where we're not, we're not capable of making the complex decisions we talk about. So recognizing that entanglement is, is increasingly understood. I think that rhymes with the worldview in history. And, and, and sort of Minoan societies, there's a beautiful book called The, Wand, uh, the Flowering Wand, which talks about you know, the kind of um, partnership societies, pre-sun god societies like Minoan societies, which had a completely different relationship to the world. And masculinity was, you know, which had, was reimagined not as being the Arthurian sword, but the wand and its entanglement. So they have a completely different world view. And I think what we're seeing is this rhyme with the past and our, and our science is already leading us there. Now we have to imagine the institutional base. I don't think it's the past. We're not going backwards. It rhymes with it, right? It rhymes with it, but it's not the past. We are going to be machine assisted to be able to see our entanglements. And that's going to entanglement will be at a planetary scale rather than just at a local scale. And that, I think, is extraordinary, an extraordinary invitation. If you have a question, just raise your hand and um, Damien or Helen will bring you a microphone. Do we have a question on the floor? Thanks. Thanks, Indy. I've got a question. You've spoken a lot about entanglement and indivisibility and interconnectedness, but then also about self-sovereignty. And you spoke about that in terms of objects like houses and cameras. But then I'm wondering whether it's also self-sovereignty of individuals and communities that uh, may occur. And then the difference between interconnectedness and self-sovereignty and that they could be opposing but also both necessary. I wonder if you could speak more to that. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. I, what I mean by the self-sovereignty is, is the perception of self, but also operating in the entanglement. So, for example, um, the materials of a house might be on a public trust and are part of a, a circularity of that material management. You may own the use rights of that house, 
but you will also have the responsibility of stewardship of that land and that materiality. So the sovereignty is actually taking a perspective from that entanglement in relationship. So it allows for the decentralized dis distributed perspectives of actually those relationships rather than centralized. And that's where the construction of agency. So you have agency and be able to perceive the world. That's why we operate. You know, the language of systems I think is really interesting. But that system means that you also recognize your entanglements. So the house also recognizes its entanglements and its interdependencies. So it's where the recognition of that entanglement lies rather than being top down or imposed. And I think those two concepts coexist, but it, they coexist in me being able to recognize my own entanglement. And that's a similar, similar perspective to that. That's the way I'm looking at it, but it's a fair question. And I don't have a, I'd love to have better language for it, but there's something really powerful about you know, this is where language of freedom, language of freedom has been largely opted, co-opted by the right in a way to talk about the freedom to escape rather than the freedom to care. And I think there are, is a different frame of actually how do you create the freedoms to care. That's I, the agency to be in relationship, the agency to be able to care for the systems you're in, in relationship with. And I think these are the soft plays that we have to make in that, in that worldview. Hi, my name's Bonnie. Um, thank you for a wonderful uh, presentation, Indy. Um, the question I have is around uh, the, how we build momentum for what are deeply progressive views in a time where there's an increasing weaponization of information and communication, um, where these kinds of concepts can be twisted and turned and um, and transformed um, and then kind of used against themselves um, and how you kind of combat that as you're trying to build momentum for meaningful change? No, it's a really fair and important question. So there's two experiences <coughs> I'd like to bring to the table. Um, so I've given these sort of talks in neighborhood scale settings, right? So one of the first things I often get accused of, and it's totally fair, is people say, Indy, these are really high floating ideas. You know, they don't work on the ground to the average Joe. Now, the first stage I figured out was that I've given these talks literally at a neighborhood scale, and I remember an 89-year-old gentleman, right, walked up to me after I'd given a talk, and he said, Indy, I didn't get everything that you said, but you put words into what I was feeling. And what that really sort of articulated for me is actually people are feeling a lot of what we're talking about. So there's a reason I talk about the fact that we're living in a great war is because I think people feel the violence. They feel the violence in the world that they exist in, the violence they're part of. So one of the key things for me is that I think a recognition that actually people feel this stuff and largely our contributions are giving wrappers to what they're feeling. The second part for me was actually, and you know, we did a piece of work where we got literally people off the street to come in and we, were, we asked them to talk, tell us what they thought about universal basic income. And they came in off the street, literally in Birmingham, and 78% of people, as they came in off the street, said, universal basic income, no way. That guy over there is gonna drink, watch TV, not gonna do any work, we're not gonna do that. Yet, we spent the day together, and in that day, we ended up, you know, lots of talks and everything else, and that number had flipped to 82% said yes to universal basic income. I thought it was, wow, all these great lectures, great talks, we'd persuaded people. And when we asked people, it wasn't that. What it was, was that guy with the funny turban and the beard, well, he was a bit like me. And what I realized was when you create environments which de-other the other, everyone else around you, people change 
their perspective or what the policy space is or what the intervention space can be. So in an othered landscape where actually your language and your frames are always that somebody else is different from you, you perceive a different possibility space. Whereas actually once you de-other that landscape of conversation, people imagine different futures in relationship to each other. So those, both those things taught me that actually we have to create a new form of convivial landscapes for the nature of conversations that we have. The problem is that we've created an opinion-orientated democracy. And actually it's not about opinions, it's about the landscapes of conversations. You know, I started this talk by saying this is a hypothesis I want to present to you. I want, I want to be challenged, I want to be better. And in conversation, we can do both. So how do we host these things in a way that facilitates us not to communicate, but to be in conversation with each other? And how do we make sure we de-other the landscape for those conversations? Because I think that changes the decision-making space that we make. And the final point is, you know, I, I do think some of this stuff is at, at a fundamental level. And we're going to have to code and recode the language that you use. I'm very careful. I didn't use the word sustainability. I didn't use the word like community. It's often used, right? Because I think words like community, you know, if you really ask me that question, I'd say community, who's inside the community, who's outside the community? They're parts of language which are always about object orientation. Whereas actually to be in communion, to be in the act of continuously behaving in community is completely different. So we're gonna to have to be precise about our language and create the convivial landscapes for these conversations and to be open to actually de-other those conversations. And finally, recognize I'm not telling people much. Many people feel this in their bones, feel this at a visceral level. And our role is to give actually color, evidence, and frames to allow people to put words to their own feelings. And those were really important to me. So whilst I recognize, I totally recognize what you're saying, that's been some of my experience. And the other thing I'd say is, I, I, I really do worry about the plain English brigade. You know, make everything simple, communicate with simplicity. That's not the issue. It's the empathy with which you communicate that matters. The openness of the dialogue that you make. It is not the simpleness that people ask for. It's the care and empathy with which you have the dialogue. And I think too often we try to simplify things and we actually undermine the capacity and underestimate the capacity of our fellow citizens to go on a complex journey with us because we don't create the landscapes of care. So I have great hope. I have great hope in our capacity to do this. I also think this requires narration. This requires narration in a particular way to construct those landscapes. There was reasons why I put the words freedom on the table because I think people feel viscerally trapped. I mean, I was sitting in an Uber, right? This, sitting in Uber here, and there was an engineer who earns 90,000 Australian dollars a year, and he was running Uber. And I was like, why the hell are you running Uber? You earn 90,000. He said, I can't afford it. I can't afford to live. This is an engineer earning 90,000 Australian dollars. And we have to understand this entrapment that people feel. We have to give language to that entrapment, and then we have to construct the politics out of that entrapment as well, in different forms. Not a big P politics, but an everyday politics that's rooted in care and comprehension. We have time for one more question. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. Through your presentation, there were some terms uh, that I, I might be completely off the mark, but feel if I'm reading between the lines, that they're alluding to the use of blockchain. Um, is that true? And if not, has blockchain informed any of this, just in terms of like um, uh, smart covenants and decentralization and smart contracts and things like that? Um, so some of the infrastructure thinking, so yes, blockchain has. The way we look at it is uh, structured economic systems. So if you look at multi-actor, uh, mass multi-actor economic models, you can start to construct some of this worldview. You can also start to, I mean, smart contracts don't actually have to be on blockchain. They can be constructed 
uh, not on blockchain or even cloud-based computing capabilities. So there is some thinking based on actually how to, how to be able to do that, but I try not to specifically get down to the blockchain level, but you can do it th that way. I think there is a real question about how we construct this computational capacity in society, which doesn't centralize either to the state or to, or, or to corporates. And that requires a different form of actually computational capability and distributed computing or edge-based computing capabilities are going to be critical and they're part of a mandate I think is going to be necessary for reimagining bureaucracy in a way that isn't easily captured. I think there's a big question about the separation of powers like we have the judiciary separated from the executive. I think we're going to separate our theories of data and public data from the executive and the judiciary. How we tend to do that, how we build the infrastructures for that is really critical. Um, so we, there's a lot of work we're doing on smart, uh, like I said, structured economic systems which recognize multiple actors can interact, uh, doing a piece of work on uh, a network of self self owning surveillance cameras which are operating in that format. So happy to get into details about that. Yes, it is operating across those landscapes, but sometimes not always blockchain per se, but yes, in that spirit. Thank you for all of your excellent questions and thank you for joining this evening. Uh, the foyer bars will be open for a little while longer if you'd like to stick around and please join me in thanking our guest, Indy Johar.